Hi, everybody, and welcome to Deep in the Bush. Joining me today is Dr. Tammy Matson. Very excited to have her on here, even if she makes me feel quite inadequate. Um, I've had to write down her list of achievements. So, Tammy, you're a scientist, conservationist, author, and mother. What haven't you done yet? <laughs> Retired, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> no, no, there's lots, so much more to be done. Oh my God, I'm just getting started, Pete. Just like you, well, this, the, the, the day is young, you know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a hell of a year, hasn't it? Yeah, oh my God. it has. Yeah, um, it's probably the toughest year for any of us in a long time. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I, and I think obviously there is perspective on all of that where we're not being bombed and our children are safe, which we're all happy with. But on the other hand, it's still crap. It's yeah. okay to say this is crap and I'm not enjoying this. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but before we, we go into crap, and we will be talking about crap later on, crap, poo, feces, however scientific you want to be, yes, we're going right. to hit you with a couple of quick questions to feel you out, have a sniff of you, see who you are. Um, don't worry, <laughs> we do this for language. everybody. Yeah. Um, first off, given the opportunity to bring back any extinct species, which one would you choose? Ah, oh, blimey. A big one or a small one? That's the question. Woolly mammoth? Mm. Woolly mammoth? Imagine if the world had woolly mammoths. I know. Again, big how cool would that be? Yeah. yeah. Or the North African elephant? Because, you know, there used to be multiple species of elephants. Uh, now now yeah. there's only two, two or three, depending on who you talk to. But, yeah, I think I'd bring back some of the elephants and some of the rhinos that have gone extinct, actually. Although we're doing a pretty good job at the moment of, um, you know, getting rid of the ones that we've, we've got left. That we yes. do have, yeah. I've, I've actually, I mean, I've heard a lot of people saying, because there's some proper effort going into bringing back things like the thylacine, the Tasmanian tiger, and even the passenger pigeon in the US. And there's one argument that says, shouldn't we be concentrating on what we've got that's under threat rather than bringing things back? But mm. I think there would still be a lot of excitement, a lot of optimism if we could bring certain species back, ones that were recently extinct. Um, yeah, I don't know if you know, um, there's a place called Wrangell Island off the States, and mammoths existed there up until only a few thousand years ago. Really? It was this last pocket, last little pocket, and, um, you know, pre-Jesus, but not far off it. I think it was yeah, about 4,000 right. years ago, the last mammoths in the world, this isolated population survived there and, yeah. and some humans arrived. So, yeah, I, I remember seeing um, mammoth ivory for sale in Bangkok when we were looking for, um, for elephant ivory and just think, what the hell is that doing there? But that's actually quite a big market as well. Yeah, but, there's, know, a, there's a store in Hong Kong and I've walked past it, I don't know how many times, and obviously due to pressure they have a big sign that says this is mammoth ivory living elephants were not killed from this it was dug out of the ice mm. the argument against that of course is you're still just spurring demand yeah that's right um, yeah and if you, if you look very closely at it this is something i didn't realize until i was involved in the um looking at the the demand for for ivory and, and the trade was you know if you look with a magnifying glass at ivory you can tell if it's real or not because of the the hatching so mm -hmm. literally real ivory has this has this cross hatching in it. Um, but you've got to look quite closely at it. So you can actually tell tell what's real and what's not. It's crazy. Yeah. 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 But you've got All to right. Next question. Really yes. Okay. Because you're out to save the world, as all good people are, you get to choose a superpower from the animal kingdom. So mm -hmm. you can swim like a dolphin. You can climb like a chimpanzee. You can only poo once a week like a sloth. Gives yeah. you a lot of free time. Um, <laughs> what, do you, what do you want? What are you going to choose? I, I kind of, um, like my, my, as you know, Pete, I have two sons and a husband, and they say I do a very good uh, death stare. Um, <laughs> and so I've always thought, imagine if you were a chameleon and you could do the death stare, but in multiple angles, both eyes at once going around. But can you imagine? That would be very effective, wouldn't it? Like my, my seven-year-old said to me this morning, Mum, can't you make that red light turn to, turn to green? I was like, wow, he's got a lot of faith in me, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> that would be pretty impressive, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Since we left Cape Town, the one thing, we used to have chameleons all through our backyard, and I, I miss it. Yeah, mm. there's some reptiles where I am now. Um, what haven't you seen? You've been a lot of places, done a lot of things. What haven't you seen? What's out well, there that you, you'd just love to see? 
Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Because after you've done a lot of travel in your life, like for a lot of my life, I was just wanting to see as much as possible and almost ticking off the boxes. You know, I've been to India, I've been to Indonesia, I've been to, um, you know, a lot of countries in Africa. And through my, my company, Matson and Ridley, I started to explore parts of Africa that I'd never been to before, like, um, you know, the Serengeti and the Masai Mara and uh, more recently Rwanda. And, um, and it's actually made me just want to explore Africa more to be honest um, although I've never been to the Americas like I actually haven't set foot on any of the Americas at all wow um, yeah that's pretty, pretty that nice surprises actually. me yeah yeah we've lived in Asia we've lived in Europe and, and traveled pretty extensively but yeah there's a lot more of Africa that I would love to see like I would definitely mm. love to go to Chad and uh, you know see Zakuba National Park yeah. and that great success story with African parks and uh, you know, bringing the elephants back from the brink there. Uh, yeah, I just think that there's, there's, there's so much more to explore, really, you know, when you think about yep. it. Yeah. I've got, I got more, more boxes to tick. Oh, uh, I think we all do. If, if I think if you've, if you've decided, no, I'm content with what I've seen, I, I'd, you're a carrot. I mean, you're, <laughs> you're just some sort of root vegetable happy to be buried in the ground. Yeah. Um, who's your conservation hero? <clears throat> oh, God, I've got heaps. I've had so many over the years. Um, I mean, as, as a young person, I suppose I started reading at about the age of 17 or 18, reading the books of um, uh, Ian Douglas Hamilton and yep. Jane Goodall and um, Diane Fossey. So they, they were really my early heroes. And for me, it was a big part. I, I kind of, I loved the fact that they were not only out there doing research and they were zoologists working in conservation in the 60s, but they were also writing books about it. And mm. for me, that was that, I didn't even realise what I was going to become, but it was, it, it, I guess that science communication thing was in me from a very early age and I didn't even know, there wasn't even a term for it back then. There were certainly no courses in science communication back when I was that age. <clears throat> but they, they were, those people that were able to tell the stories as well as go and live that life. I was really inspired by them. But these days, I mean, I've actually met quite a few of my heroes. It's it's quite amazing. In the last 10 years, I, I got to meet them through my, my work. Mm. And probably the people that inspire me most these days, actually, are the people on the ground, uh, especially women who are working in conservation with kids. I know how hard that is. <laughs> mm. I just think that's those those people I know, I could just roll off so many names. I mean, uh, Dr. Jennifer Lally, who we both know well, she's one yep. of my closest mates and is one of my great heroes as well so these women that are uh, kind of doing it all it's they, they're looking making it look easy but it's it's really not it's it's a tough job both jobs are tough yeah I mean I I find it tough to do what I do with two kids and having all the advantages of being a white male and you know I'm aware that those those advantages are out there um yeah and it's still bloody exhausting as I said I'm just yeah <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, so we're going to talk quite a bit about elephants today, this morning for me, this evening for you. What's a myth about elephants that persists? Oh, gosh, myth. Well, I guess, I mean, a lot of the myths that we've been dealing with with relation to the ivory trade have been mm -hmm. how people perceive how the ivory gets to Asia. So one of the big things, you know, when, when yeah. I lived in Singapore quite some time ago now, but when we started trying to get the message out there about um, stopping people buying ivory because we realised, I think this was back in what was it, maybe 2013 or so, there was a sudden realisation that a lot of the the drive for um, ivory, it was going to, to, to Asia, largely to China, but also to parts of Southeast Asia as well. And I was living in mm -hmm. Southeast Asia at that time. And there was this, this, you know, even just talking to people in Bangkok, for example, and Singapore, people just didn't realise where the ivory came from. And right. the more, you know, there was a, a sentiment. You'd go on social media, and people would be like, "Oh, you know, these, these people they just don't understand what you know the, the damage they're causing." There was almost this vitriol and hatred going on. It was it was actually quite racist. But actually, a lot of people in Asia just didn't realise that the ivory had to be hacked out of the faces of these elephants. They had to be killed to get the ivory. A lot of them thought it just dropped out like like teeth. Um, and that was that yep. was a really big revelation for me. Um, uh, you know, just that there are all these myths out there. Um, you know, around rhino horn as well. You know, when I went to Vietnam mm -hmm. and, you know, you go into those markets and, of course, you'll never be told uh, where the uh, where the rhino horn is because it's worth 60, I think at the time it was worth 65,000 US dollars per kilogram. But you more can see... More yeah, than cocaine. More than cocaine, right? More than cocaine. Yeah. 
Yeah. So you could, you could see the thing gold that goals. we're less interested in. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, but you could see the bowls and you could, you know, you could talk to people about it. But the most distressing thing for me, I think, was going into one of the um, the hospitals where children were being treated for cancer in mm. Hanoi in Vietnam. And those parents were being told by these traffickers that rhino horn would cure your kids' uh, yeah. cancer. You know, and that is a total, total myth. Um, I mean, that's that's it, obviously. Yeah, I know that is driving. It, but it's, again, I think what a lot of people don't realise is the person poaching a rhino is not necessarily evil. Most of the time they're desperate. Mm -hmm. um, the person buying rhino horn or ivory is not necessarily evil. They're just uninformed. The people in the middle are evil, without yeah. a doubt evil. Uh, I mean, yeah. you, it is so easy to sell hope to someone with a sick kid and yeah. to sell them false hope. Yeah. knowingly yeah, yeah because it doesn't work i mean it doesn't cure cancer <laughs> yeah i mean it, since, since we're going to be talking about poo a lot you're a shithead when you do that i mean it's just <laughs> horrible the most horrible yeah, thing so, yeah um all right so what is a truth or a fact about elephants that most people don't know but that they should know mm, that they should know um Gosh, you need to know everything about elephants, don't you? Is there anything that's <laughs> yeah, important? I mean, it's it's, it's funny. Do. I mean, there, there's certain things like you hear. There's the old, old, tiny legend. You know, an elephant doesn't forget. And that one actually seems to be pretty true. They do seem yeah. to have extraordinary memories. They can yeah. return to a place a decade after they were last there, and they know where the water is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whether they're detecting it or remembering, still up in the air. But um, definitely this idea that they mourn their dead, that yes. seems to be a ton of evidence for that. Um, yeah. uh, and yeah, the elephant graveyards kind of half in truth and half out of it. Yeah, uh, I think there's, there's a there's a chunk of truth in that though, because there is definitely a recognition of um, you know there is a spirituality in elephants that there's something else going on there. No question about yeah. it. They are sentient beings, and um, they have an awareness of um, of life and death. And I think the big thing about elephants really is how much like us they are. I mean, the the families are. are you know, so much like us. If you if you see a herd of elephants, if you go on a safari in Africa and you just see it, you'll see a large group of elephants that is probably going to be mostly females uh, with with their young, and most of them will be related to each other. So they're not just this random accumulation of of um, elephants that just ran into each other at the pub and said, "Okay, yeah, let's go and hang out." No, yeah. these are actually related. This is granny, aunties, mums, sisters. Um, you know, and they're really close, and these are lifelong bonds and um, the more you get to know the sort of individuals, which is this, this process that we're going through in um, Akagera, is, is it, it just, just the whole world just opens to you as you get to know these individuals because um, they, they're all really different and they've all got different personalities and you know some are very protective, some are, yeah. are very nervous. Uh, sometimes you can see, we don't know if they're sisters because we haven't been studying them long enough, but we've seen even last December we saw two females, both young females with small tusks. One of them had a new baby and they were literally standing right next to each other with the baby between the two legs. And you look at that and you go, okay, I'm making assumptions here, but there's a very good chance these two are related and they were, were clearly both looking after that baby together. Like yeah. um, I think it's called aloe mothering as well. But very different to impalas, of course, where impalas do have this random aggregation of, you know, there's an impala, great, I'll hang out with you. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, Elephants in that sense are, are much more like us. And um, I guess that's the biggest message I'm always trying to get through to people is, you know, it's, what, it's so important for us to conserve these species because um, you know, we, when, if we lose elephants, I think we're losing you know, the good part of ourselves, really. I, yeah, I agree. And, and, and I've, I think it staggers people to consider, for me, that an elephant is more like us perhaps than a chimpanzee is. Physiologically, mm. they're so different, but socially they're so much the same and they're so relatable because of that and i also think that they've been perhaps underestimated you spoke of be it spirituality or emotional bonds that they have but also their intelligence we've got so many test results on chimpanzees on rats um, even now on octopus because you can put them in a maze pretty easily i mean think of the size of the maze you've got to build and what you've got to make it from to test an elephant yeah. so we don't have all of this captive testing. And, I, and I, I'm not suggesting that would be a good thing, but I think it's only now we're starting to understand how intelligent elephants are. And, and maybe they're not making tools because they don't need them. You know, they don't need to build yeah. a house. They've got, their skin is their house. Yeah. yeah. You know, they, they, don't, they don't need 
to alter a branch to make a tool because their trunk is one of the most extraordinary organs in the world. Yes. They can do all the things that a modified tool would do. They've probably yeah. got the capability. They're just not using it. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's I mean, that's, right. I, yeah. I, I think you and I are on the same page in, in thinking they're amazing animals. There's something you said then, which is, uh, I think leads us neatly into uh, the next question where you're, you mentioned Akagira and the elephant project. Can you please explain what the Akagira elephant project is and where it is? Right. So, well, Akagera National Park is probably one of the lesser known national parks in central East Africa. It's on the eastern side of Rwanda. So most people go to Rwanda and they want to experience, experience the gorillas, the mountain gorillas. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's what Rwanda's famous for. And it is the most amazing experience. But if you look at Rwanda, it's a tiny little country. And on one side of the country, you have the, the, uh, the, the Barungas, the Volcanoes National Park, which is where the gorillas live. And that is, you know, deep, dark forest with forest <clears throat> elephants and buffalo. And the other side of the country <clears throat> is Akagera. And it's, it's, uh, it's savannah and uh, hills and vast lakes. And it basically adjoins Tanzania. So, I mean, I'd never heard of Akagera until a few years ago. And it really feels like, uh, you know, in the last five years, we've seen Rwanda just open up to the world because until recently nobody knew anything about Rwanda apart from the fact that there were gorillas there and there was a, a major genocide. In 94. Um, 94, yeah. So it's, it took a long time to recover and uh, Akagera started to become known when African parks moved in there and they partnered with the Rwandan government and together this partnership's just been amazing because in the last 10 years since they started they've brought back the lions they've brought back rhinos they've removed snares across the whole park and they needed to do that because uh the, the park literally became a war zone during the genocide mm -hmm. um uh it, it, it was an absolute mess and then after the genocide people came back um and these were survivors and they they you know they were they needed to do anything they could to survive so really conservation animals are second to yeah. survival in a situation like that so um, it was a real mess. Uh, and today we see the elephants that are left in Akagera have a lot of wounds from that era. Um, they, when I first met them a couple of years ago, they were still quite aggressive, some of them. Um, mm. The males, a couple of males had a reputation for flipping vehicles. Um, those ones have mostly died now. They were quite, quite old. But the, the elephants have this amazing story. Like, this is what really got me into this. I mean, apart from the fact that Akagera has come back from this terrible era and just rebuilt itself and has truly re rewilded, um, the elephants were brought in, uh, I think it was something like 25 years ago, and they, uh, they were brought in from a cold population. So there was only about 26 of them brought in. They were right. all very young, under the age and of... where were they brought in from? from another area where they were causing conflict uh, in Rwanda. So they were Rwandan elephants, but yeah. it's more... To, it's it's I mean, it's a small country, so it's amazing small. that they had that yeah. population to move. Yeah, and, and they killed most of them in that area. Um, it, was mm -hmm. a, it was a conflict issue at that. The government at that time decided that was the thing to do. This was pre-Kagami, who's the president yep. now. Um, anyway, so they brought these youngsters in, and you can imagine a 10-year-old elephant and younger. These are really traumatised animals. They've been brought in uh, under tough, tough situation. They they may have seen the killing of their of their families, and they've been brought into this park, and now they're just told to go and survive. Some of them uh, were semi hand raised uh, by some of the rangers. So the stories of one of the old, uh, well, he's, he was an old bull until recently. He died recently, but he was actually hand fed Coca Cola uh, by. <laughs> some of the rangers. So he became very almost tame and very unafraid of people. So he became a bit of a problem elephant in the end. Um, but essentially Power all these elephants. Cheap. I mean, that's... Yeah, good question, right? Uh, that... Well, actually they were gone. That's a very good point. I suddenly realized that. Um, he, he, he had his, he didn't have tusks. So right. for whatever reason, he didn't have tusks. And, um, but he was a problem elephant and he wasn't accepted by the other male elephants uh, because he'd been semi-hand raised. So right. um, he was a real outsider and he was disgruntled and um, so he was well known. Um, anyway, the rest of these elephants, they slowly built up in, against the odds, uh, but of course their habitat is now full of snares. And until African Parks moved in in this partnership with the Rwandan Development Board, uh, those snares were everywhere. So the process of just, you know, 
is took years to, to fix this yeah. problem. Just to butt in for a moment, um, African Parks is an NGO that doing extraordinary work across the continent and in a lot of places the tourists don't go and they partner with the government <clears throat> with the agreement that they will come in funding a, you know, they bring in the funding which they obviously have to to source themselves but they reduce poaching significantly you can never quite eliminate it but reduce it they've had enormous success they do provide employment in the local areas and as part of that anti-poaching effort um, they bring in animals that might have been wiped out in the area if they're able to, like you said, the lions into Akagira, first lions mm -hmm. in Rwanda in a quarter of a century, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, often with private companies, safari companies assisting them with that, doing amazing work. Um, and again, a lot of people haven't heard of them because they quietly get the job done instead of waving a flag the whole time. Yeah, it's so you're true. busy doing stuff. Yeah, they yeah. they really are. They they are my, my absolute favourite, you know, on ground organisation in Africa. I think their achievements just speak for themselves. They mm. they literally turn wildlife populations around, uh, and that's what we're seeing in Akagera. I mean, even just yeah. the last couple of years, they brought in five uh, black rhinos from European zoos. Uh, can you imagine that? Like these animals had never seen a wild space until they were brought back to Akagera. They were flown over from I think one one was from Britain. Others were from the Czech Republic, yeah, uh, and then they were set free in this in this little special area um, that's being managed also by Wilderness Safaris and their um, tourism operation there. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it really speaks for itself. The lion population, I think, has tripled since they started, but they've done they've done some really. But we smart all know stuff. that lions are very promiscuous, and given the chance, they will <laughs> yes. they'll breed yeah. up quickly un until they, there's they start fighting each other. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. But the big thing they did was they built a fence as well. They they did build a fence separating the um, the community. So the elephants that were causing problem outside the park, they immediately stopped that problem, and they worked very closely with the community to. Uh, you know, to get people on board, to train local community guides and develop uh, beekeeping and mushroom growing and all that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, working with the community is a big part of what, what they're what, What's to. the mushroom growing about? Um, I, I don't know. I actually haven't seen it, but I believe is it's... Is it's it for a commercial reason or have they got some other use for them? Yeah, I, look, I, think, I think it's largely subsistence. Don't quote me on this, but... Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess there's a view to making it more commercial in, in the future. They'd be open to it. Um, but I think at this stage, you know, they're really just trying to provide economic opportunities for local people living on the edge of the park, so to bring okay. them some benefits. And yeah. so are they using the elephant droppings as a base for it? Because that would be amazing to grow mushrooms in, I think. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Yeah. I should I'll mention that to them. Yeah. <laughs> that's a great um, idea. Yeah. Now, now I, I've kind of hinted at this a bit, um, and it was actually something you'd written to me before we, we did this. Why the fascination with elephant dung? Oh, elephant dung's awesome. I mean... All dung's are awesome. Um, it, all dung has its merits. Let me just say that. But elephant dung. And this has is remember, so yeah, you've got a husband and two boys, so that's a remarkable statement. <laughs> but I'm a zoologist, so I've always had a fascination, a fascination with dung. And um, but elephant dung, of course, has got so much in it. I mean, it is it is an ecosystem on its own. Uh, you know, you just have to open up a bolus, and you just you know you see the dung beetles coming out of it, like you know, maybe six or seven species suddenly fly out. I remember being in uh, Namibia a few years ago in the Huanuk River and it dry as dry. We were there in the dry season and we walked along the riverbed and uh, we're walking under some anna trees and uh, I found this really dry looking piece of dung and I picked it up and I opened it up and I couldn't believe it inside was a little seedling that germinated and was bright green. Wow. It was just the beginning of it and everything else was dry. You couldn't see any water in this environment. I just thought, God, that, isn't that amazing that, you know, this one thing that we would, most people would just ignore or drive over actually has has so much life in it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, I mean, as you said, it's an ecosystem. <clears throat> it holds the moisture. It's a it's a ball of compost. Um, so it can even generate heat. I mean, I've, I've actually been in a, a bushfire where we created a, a, a human chain where we could all see each other and it was, to make sure that the fire didn't jump over a road. And it kept flaring up behind us and we'd have to fall back and start again. And it felt like it was human laziness, human mm -hmm. error was allowing the fire to jump. And what we realized was the elephant droppings, which were already composting, were spontaneously combusting. They had so much right. heat, latent heat in them already that once wow. the air got dry enough that they were just bursting into flames of their own and setting the fire 
behind us as we watch wow. the firewall come at us. The next yeah. thing was behind us as well. I mean, it, it, remarkable can be frightening like that. I mean, you know, if you're in Botswana, for example, and you find an old elephant dropping and it's filled with marula seeds or marula fruits, like, well, this is put here end of February sometime in March. Yeah. I can tell you the story of it. You can even, yeah. you can date the poo, mm. um, which sounds like a kind of movie they make in Hollywood. Um, <laughs> but <clears throat> it, you can tell how old it is by what the food is. If it's strands of grass, it was December, January. Mm. Um, so there is a lot of information in there as well. It's, it's a book. Yeah. It's a book you yeah, can read and, if, um, if you know how to read the alphabet. That, that's that's exactly right. And actually, there's so much we probably don't know about it. But um, I remember the I can't remember if it was the San Bushman or the Damaras in in Namibia telling me that it was a good idea if you've if you've got a cold as well um, to boil up elephant dung and mm -hmm. the smoke really helps uh, with whatever ailment you've got at the time. I did try that, I must admit, but I did I did end up with uh, quite a lot of elephant crap and bugs on yeah. me. <laughs> and I didn't really feel better afterwards, I have to say. <laughs> but, I've, but I've maybe... tried a lot of traditional remedies and the ones that I've found have the most success are actually the hallucinogens. Um, <laughs> and then everything, everything else is, it, maybe it's good. I've, I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. It's just not not been my poison plenty too many other vices but yeah. um i have smoked a toad that was wildly effective um wow. but then i've tried the i was bunged up and yeah i tried breathing in this and i breathe it's like well now i'm bunged up and puking <laughs> just all <laughs> so horrible <laughs> so i'm not going to burn an i'm not going to burn anybody's turd to yeah. make my breathing better unless you know what's in it yeah that's Actually, true. sometimes yeah. you think they're just going Hey, did you hear about what I did to that guy? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably more likely, come to think of it. <laughs> okay, I want to take us back a few steps here. You, you mentioned impalas and how their social structure is different to elephants. Now, the impala is where there are impalas, they're typically the most common antelope. Mm. Uh, there's a bunch of reasons for that. And... People see their first one, if it's their first trip to Africa ever, they take a million photos of an impala 100 metres away. Within an hour, they are completely blasé about impalas. They're, they, they're like flies, the flies of the savannah. Um, mm. Yet you chose to do your PhD on them, a particular subspecies, the black-faced impala. Um, why impalas? What drew you to them? The, the, the comment, and I, I happen to like them. I think they're incredibly important. Mm. However, Why you did just describe them it? as flies, Peter. Hmm? Well, listen, I, yeah, I don't like flies. I do like impalas. <laughs> That's right. It's amazing how many insults are made about impalas. Uh, and I know you didn't mean it in that way, but maybe I'm oversensitive. Um, but they, they are, I really think they're the most underrated uh, animal on the savannah. Uh, and they provide food for all the predators. Um, they, they, they are abundant for a reason. You know, they're, they're Africa's most successful antelope. Um, so what, what, how do you get to be that successful? Super smart, like super smart. Um, I remember back in, oh, I would have been about uh, 20, I suppose, in Zimbabwe working in the Savi Valley Conservancy. It was my first field research project on impalas. And uh, I totally underestimated them like everybody else. I was like, oh, impalas, I want to work on cheetahs or leopards or something interesting, you know. Yeah. Anyway, I ended up working on impalas because my supervisor thought, here's this young girl, she's going out to Africa, she doesn't know what she's doing, we'll just make it easy and, you know, she can watch them nod their heads or whatever. So but everybody <laughs> underestimated them. Yeah, but it was really not that easy. And the thing is, if you're on foot and you want to observe how vigilant uh, impalas are, vigilance being, you know, how alert they are, um, well, how do you measure that? Well, it's based on how many times they look up, they look up perhaps in a minute. I think we were using that okay. measurement at the time. Um, how many times and also how long out of that minute. So you, we used to time it. Um, and you could you could compare all sorts of things like, you know, uh, in a hunting area, for example, compared to a photographic safaris area. You know, that was one of the, the, the focuses of that study was how does impala vigilance compare between areas where they're hunted and where they're not, or areas where there's been uh, cheetahs recently uh, hunting, yeah. perhaps hunting them or, or not. And, um, and, you know, how do those two effects compare? So I got to work this amazing uh, uh, Shona Tracker, um, Iphias, who uh, sadly passed away now, but he, he was an amazing teacher. And for me, really being out in the bush for not very long on my own, um, we, would, we were in really remote areas all the time. And had to get very close to these animals and 
let me tell you, if you're walking up to impalas, and these are animals that are used to being hunted by whatever predators are in the area, especially if there's been wild dogs around, they're, they're super, super alert. Um, so that they're, they're always, there's always uh, animals looking around, like they're always going to be looking. So yeah. you have to get really good at stalking to be able to get close to them if you want to observe them. Um, or either that or you've got to have a really good set of binoculars. But of course, impalas aren't springboks, they're, they're in quite, you know, dense edge habitats quite often. So it's, it's, it's never, it was, certainly wasn't that easy. And particularly these elephants, uh, not elephants, impalas where we were working had been hunted. So they were particularly wary. Yeah. Um, so all well, well, I've always said, you know, that, that the impalas are alert for a living. That is their job. Oh. First and mm. foremost is to, to remain alert because when they have a bad day at work, it's not like they lose a bit of money. Yeah. They die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. in daytime, it's cheetahs and it's um, it's uh, wild dogs, like you mentioned. I mean, I've even mm. seen a martial eagle on a, a, a two-year-old impala round. That's a big antelope. Yeah. So, uh, look this way, look this way. Oh, you know, death from the sky. Great. I'd like a drink. Yeah. There's a decent chance of a crocodile and maybe a python will take me. Oh, good. Yep. Now at night and it's just lions, leopards and hyenas. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a break. <laughs> um, and then you think of the stress of parroting it. We're worried about our kids running on a road. They're yeah. surrounded by roads with, with fast yeah. moving traffic. Everything yeah. eats baby impalas. Yes. I mean, it, yes. Horrible, horrible existence from our yeah. human perspective. So, but also, yeah, they're also really right. against you, aren't they? I mean, if you're, if you're uh, an impala baby, the chances of you making it to adulthood. I mean, we, we studied this with the black faced impalas in Ongava in mm -hmm. Namibia, and I think it was only about 25% of the youngsters that were born that year made it to two months. So, wow. You know, that's like such low odds, isn't it? I think yeah. survival odds. And the, the mothers are really, again, super smart. Like they, impalas are always together in a crowd. Like for them, the, the bigger the numbers usually, uh, the better, the safer you are in larger numbers. But um, there's one time where you will see uh, impala females on their own and that's when they've got a brand new baby. So for that first few days of life, they disappear into the bush and they sort of realise that the conspicuousness of the herd is damaging to that to them at that point because the, the lamb is more likely to be taken than any other animal. It can't run very fast. And all it can do is sort of shrink down and hide for that time. Um, so for that that period of time, but you know what, we we were tracking them with, with uh, radio collars at Ongava uh, during those two months after the females gave birth. And uh, they were all fairly predictable until they gave birth. And then we just, we could not find them. They just went miles right. away. Yeah, they totally outsmarted us, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when you talk about them being smart, they're not going to beat you at Scrabble, are they? <laughs> but it's, it's smart, it's clever adaptations. Evolution's been smart with them. Is that what you mean? Or do you mean that they're yeah. actually, as a species, they're, they're clever? They, oh, yeah. um, Look, how do you define smart? They I mean, read the better books. Um, yeah, that they've got good fashion sense. Yeah. Um, I don't know how do you, it's, I don't know. I mean, I think of, like there's a lot of species that I look at and go, God, I would... There's, there's certain elements of them that I go, that's just really, that's really awesome. They all, they have, their superpower is they know how to survive um, yeah. en masse and to build up their numbers. So if their success is judged as a population across Africa, they, they might, you know, they're up there with, with the top. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, I mean, I'm always impressed by, obviously, you have something like a wildebeest. It's not only does he only eat grass, he only eat short grass. Mm. So it's a, well, you better be in a place with short grass. And the moment there's a a, a forest, they're walking through it. That's yeah. um, and they're terrified. They can't run particularly fast in there. They're, they're lion yeah. bait in a habitat. Yeah. If you're a kudu, you only eat leaves. So get stuck out in an open plain. You're a bit screwed because you're not good at running fast in a straight line. You're good at jumping over bushes. So mm. really niche. Whereas the impala says, you know what? I'm going to eat leaves and I'm going to yeah. eat grass and I'll eat yeah. fallen flowers and and fruit. Yeah, a lot. Um, and yep. I'll have lower teeth like a comb so that I can <laughs> remove ticks on myself and the rest of the herd and we remain in better health as a collective. There's yes. just all these things as, as you keep adding up. Well, they, they yeah. basically, why didn't everybody else think of this? It's really, it's, that's, that, is, that is smart. You've got to say that's smart. Yeah. I mean, I, I've seen them eat um, uh, calcrete rocks in uh, Atosha. Right. You know, in Just the same the way, I think, uh, yeah, probably for the for the nutrients, because mm -hmm. there's a nutrient deficiency there. Uh, in the same way that I suppose giraffes, I've seen giraffes eating, chewing on bones there as well. They're not yeah. eating them; they're just chewing on them almost. Um, but yeah, and and eating other uh, animals dung as well. Like I've seen impalas eating um, other animals dung as well. I mean, I it might, maybe it's certain 
time that, that they need the extra nutrients or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like that diversity and that um, adaptability to, uh, to be, and the fact that they live on ecotones as well. So, uh, you know, whereas, you know, your gazelles and your springboks, they're all these open grassland species, your kudus tend to be in the, in the woodland. Uh, impalas like that ecotone. So you're more likely to see them on the edge of a grassland. They don't like to be too far out if they get a choice, um, but just, you know, near that, that safety of the woodland. Um, but yeah, I mean, God, everything eats them. They are literally oh, yeah. fast food. And I often tell people it's, you know, it's, it's this is maybe all the guides tell this joke about how they got the M on their rear end. Um, that is, everyone tells that, right? <laughs> it's not just the, me. Yeah, the McDonald's, yeah, it's, um, yeah. yeah, with natural selection who I work for now, that's a, a written warning if you use that joke. <laughs> been around, been been around, around for long, too long, right? Don't let it yeah. go. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, same so, if you say flying banana for a yellow hornbill. It's like, no, 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 no. You can't yeah, do that yeah. one anymore. It's been done. We need some new material here. Yeah. God damn it. Okay. Um, yeah. So, but they they really get eaten by everything, and that's that's I think the I think that's the thing that I admire most about them. And so I didn't think this at the start when I first started working on them. I was like, probably like everyone else, everyone just drives past them. Once you've seen your first lot of impala, it's like, okay, next, you know, what's what's next? Uh, where are the lions? And the number of people that used to come up to me when I had a big impala on my on the side of my car in Atosha when I was doing my PhD there and uh, literally just pulled me up to say, where are the lions? And I was just like, oh, God, God, I hate those lions. The lions um, are asleep somewhere. Yes, exactly. The impalas are doing something. That's right. They're not yeah. doing anything interesting. Um so yeah, but anyway, I, my love of impalas definitely grew, and and I think um, having worked, I worked on them for about six years, and uh, that was in Namibia, and then I I got to be uh, involved in writing then the national management plan for black-faced impalas as well, because when we when I first started in Namibia, not much was known about black-faced impalas, um, apart from the fact that they're a bit bigger and they had the black face. Um, it, not a great deal was known, and we knew that they came from northwest Namibia, so the Kanini region. Uh, and Angola, but it was believed, and it still is believed, that they're extinct in Angola. So really, Namibia is the place to go. If I was going to ask about whether there's any left there. Yeah. Yeah, uh, not that I'm aware of. I've never heard of heard of any. I'd love to, I'd love it if there was. I've always wanted to go and explore that area. I'm, um, I'm, I'm talking to Steve Boys um, early next week, so I'll ask him if he's. Oh yeah, find out left. definitely. Yeah, uh, um, but they are doing much better. I mean, they were in there was only about i think three thousand left this is now i mean this is talk, we're talking about 20 years ago now and the the big threat to them at that stage in namibia was interbreeding with common impala because so many of the bit had been put onto private game farms and uh where there were already common impala and people didn't realize that they would interbreed and that the, the genetics would be completely changed by that um, so the government then focused through after we wrote the management plan on reintroducing them back to their historic range so we went up to all the communal conservancies in northwest Namibia and did an assessment of, you know, which ones uh, would be most suitable in terms of community capacity and habitat um, and water. Water is a big one for black-faced impala. Like all impalas, they need a water water hole, um, and uh, and and just basically made recommendations on how they could be returned to their historic range. And I believe that has that has gone ahead. And with the communities, they were happy to have impala coming back in. Um, they. Or were they nervous that they might compete with their goats for food because an impala will eat pretty much anything a goat eats? Yeah, I mean I, that's that's a good question. Um, I think I think they the, the people we spoke to anyway, the community leaders were interested in having them back. Um, I mean they they had been poached out by largely by the army during the independence war up to 1993. So you know it wasn't uh, they may have had a hand in in some of the poaching, but um, you know I think I think there was. A strong sense of you know conservation is good and it, these, these animals will bring tourism uh, to the area and that area of yeah. course is just growing in tourism so um so overall it was seen as a, as a pretty good thing okay yeah. so you you studied impalas for six years you said or seven six six yeah six and mm -hmm. then you shifted to elephants um quite a jump and they've been quite a focus for a while um, and you did mention these bulls that, that charge vehicles quite a bit what is scarier facing a charging elephant or being on the human end when you're in a, a wildlife market somewhere in Asia and you can see tusks or rhino horn for sale and you yeah. know the kind of people behind that trade, which which do mm. you find more frightening? Oh, that's Homo sapiens are way more scary in any scenario. In, they are by far the scariest species on the planet. I think that's yeah. undisputed. Um, 
and yeah, there was definitely times in, uh, you know, when I went to Hanoi um, and, I, you know, I'd left two little kids behind and um, I was on my own and I went in there with Traffic, uh, which is a fantastic organisation that works to stop the illegal trade in, in various parts of the world. And uh, they took me in. And I mean, even when we, you know, dur during the make, we made a documentary as well during those years, Let Elephants Be Elephants, which aired on National Geographic Channel across Asia. It was part of our awareness raising. And, uh, you know, going into Bangkok even and wearing um, glasses that had a secret camera in the corner. And I was the one that looked more nerdy because I was there with Nadia Hutgalong, who is a famous model and actress in Asia. So I think she she can't she can't even look nerdy at the at the best of times. So I went for that look with the with the big uh, glasses and uh, just pretending to look at Ivory. And everywhere we went, it, it was like you just you're just having am I getting the right angle here? And I kept going in like this. And moments like that, though, you're just like this is uh, this is quite surreal. And some some of the people uh, did not want to talk about us, and they didn't want to talk to us. They literally mm. were pushing us to the side. I think there was the beginning of suspicions around, you know, these people are asking too many questions. Yeah. Um, Vietnam was more nerve wracking because, you know, I was asking questions about uh, the rhino horn trade, which is a different sort of trade. It's 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 uh, it's much more hardcore, and there's really serious criminals involved in it. Uh, and it's the uber rich that are buying it in Vietnam. So it's high level government officials, people that can afford to put some of this uh, ground up rhino horn into their rice wine uh, at, a, at a, a luxury party and, and show it off to their friends. This is not the everyday Vietnamese people at all. Um, so yeah, I had to be a little bit careful. And yeah, that, that compared to charging elephants, yeah, not, not even comparable. You, you're uh, beefing. Yeah, sorry, my, my phone was buzzing at me. Um, I still don't have a setup where I can have my questions on anything else. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I agree. People far, far more frightening than animals. I think I've been charged by everything. Mm. Um, I've been what is your What is your scariest one? Like, what's your What's been your scariest experience? Uh, the American women's rugby team. They were on <laughs> safari and they got drunk, and three of them packed down and said, "Scrum against us." And I, no. <laughs> you know, normally as a safari guide you say yes of course we'll do this what what fun what fun yeah, this yeah, would yeah. be and i just thought that no you're all hooker uh, <laughs> i was i was i actually felt physically intimidated and threatened <laughs> i mean i'm not a big guy yeah <laughs> and, right yeah and you were a rugby all, player right sorry you were a rugby player at one stage yeah right? but i was the world's yeah. worst rugby player oh okay i was okay. bad at i'm terrible at sport my parents were cousins. Well, I think so anyway. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, and, and they were obviously all very good at sport. They mm. were playing for the US, but they, um, they, they were well built. Mm. Uh, and, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not sure where it was going to end. I, I just figured at some point I would be bowled to the ground and I didn't like the idea of what might happen next. Yeah, so, <laughs> that does sound scary. But actually. I think people are normally disappointed with that. They want to know what. Is yeah, well, that is the thing, though. I mean, it, the more time you spend with animals, though, the more respect you have for them and the less you want to get in their face and do, a, like, a steve and wrestle or anything like that. Like, it's the absolute opposite, actually. Yeah. I think the more I work with elephants now, the more space I want to give them because I want to really observe what they're doing. I don't want to interfere with their natural behaviour and make them feel uncomfortable. So I want to get people close so they can, you know, really appreciate the wrinkles and, uh, you know, the, the, the eyelashes and all that sort of stuff and get great photos. But you definitely don't want to be messing with, their mojo in, in any way and if you get charged there's a reason for it right yeah i, I mean it, it can it can happen where you've done nothing wrong um i mean i've i have had cases where it's literally just been i've rounded a corner in a vehicle or even on foot and mm -hmm. i had not perceived the elephants they were well screened uh perhaps if i'd, I'd had the ninja vision of some of the you know the shungans and shaunas and um uh, motswana people i've worked with i would have seen them i didn't mm -hmm. The elephants have been agitated by my presence and they've charged and i don't feel i've done anything wrong at that point but you're certainly in a bad situation but if i look back at a lot of the more frightening things that have occurred to me at the start of my career i definitely made mistakes hmm. you know, hmm. the times I, I i don't think i've ever been charged by a line where i hadn't done something wrong yeah um where yeah. all the signs were there to tell me it's about to go tits up, which is a scientific mm. term. Um, and I've definitely, 
a number of times with elephants as well. Just again, it was accidentally pushing the boundaries, not reading their body language. Because elephants, is there mm. any animal more expressive with its body language? Yeah, yeah. They usually let you know, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, and although not always, I mean, that, that this, I'm just thinking back to a couple of years ago now with um, this elephant that we've, we've come to know called Lorenzi. Her, her name, it's a her, but we thought it was a he for a long I time. I wanted to ask about this. Yeah, she... Yeah was very aggressive the first time we met her. In fact, she was the very first elephant I ever saw in Akigera and she just came for us. And she's she's a big female and she has big cross tusks. Like she's very um, obvious uh, to uh, everyone. In fact, she's the cover girl for um, uh, African Park's posters as you come into the park. Right. And I think for a long time, everyone just thought it, it was a bull because um, you know, she's got a really big rounded head. And so obviously male elephants have the rounded heads and females have the square heads. Um, and she's a lot bigger than the others. And often when we saw her, she was on her own, uh, but either on her own or with this other young elephant who we called Survivor because um, Survivor is called Survivor because uh, she has uh, really bad wounds from snares. So she has only half a trunk. Um, three of her legs are very badly wounded. So she sort of hobbles along on one front leg and, and, ha and can touch on the other side. Uh, so she walks very slowly and she's a young elephant. And But, you know, when I first met her, I was like, were oh, these, this elephant's not going to snares that were set up to catch elephants or were they just no. set to catch anything? So she's just got sheer bad luck that she's had three yeah. on, and, you know, on three feet. Gosh. Yes, I'm just she's definitely the worst case that, that I've yeah. seen. And But there are uh, multiple elephants that have got tips of trunks off or half mm -hmm. trunks in Akagera or damaged legs. Um, you know, one big bull sort of walks with a, a leg off to one side. Um, and um, so, so that, you know, they really are victims of, of the war in a sense. And mm -hmm. they're only beginning to calm down now. So, you, you know, Marinzi, although she charged us that, that day, what I didn't realise was this whole other part to her story. I just thought this was a, a bull charging us. And um, Gottfried, uh, who's uh, my awesome assistant there, he literally banged on the roof and he, he yelled and it, and it stopped her in her tracks. And she looked at us, she stood, she did that thing where they just you know, rise up and then she, then she went back and then she sort of lifted off and went off to the side, thankfully. But, and you know, it doesn't matter how much you work with these big animals, it's still, you feel the fear, your heart is yeah. beating in your ears and uh, that, that never goes away. I think that's really, really healthy actually. Um, so in that moment I was like, oh man, I wonder what, what's put the wind up that bull. And then it, was, it wasn't until the next field season. So a year later, I came back and we realised, hang on, this Marinzi and Survivor are always together. What's going? What is going on here? Because whenever the charge charges were happening for Marinzi, we realised that it was almost like she was getting in between us and this other young damaged right. what we thought was a bull. So it was actually really protective behaviour. And it was it was only only literally in January after I'd written all my official reports about these two amazing bulls and their close relationship <laughs> that we realised these were actually two females and possibly. Uh, a ma a, 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 it could be a mother-daughter relationship. We don't know. Um, but, but uh, yeah, they're always together. And uh, they actually, as we got to know them better, they trail a particular clan, which we call Clan A. It's one, one of the smaller smaller groups. So they're never that far away from Clan A. But they're obviously very slow because of Survivor and, and her wounds. But, yeah, if you get close to Marinzi, and, um, you know, we have a WhatsApp group going. So the local guides are the ones who keep this project going when I'm not there. And so they're always feeding into... You know, whenever they see an elephant group or an elephant in the park, they send a message on the WhatsApp so we can all see, you know, where this group is, where that individual is. And they're using this ID database that we created over the last couple of years, which can identify elephants by their tusks and their and their ears. So we're beginning to get a sense of who these elephants are and, and, a, and a little glimpse into their relationships. And it's, it's just, it's absolutely fascinating. That's the thing which I think... It's great to go on safari and you see these things for a few days, but when you're watching it, you realize what a soap opera it is. I mean, yeah. you might be addicted to The Crown or whatever it is on Netflix, but this wildlife soap opera, and I think there's some better documentaries now that are showing that these dramas, family dramas, go on mm -hmm. for generations and there is no beginning and end. It's it's yeah. hundreds of thousands, millions of years old, this, this drama. Yeah. Uh, the rise and fall of families and dynasties um mm. or dynasties as our american friends would say and i miss that you know i still get to go on mm. safari as you do but i miss going 
Well, it's because this one is related to that one, but they had a falling out and so they've split up, but yeah, they'll get back together. It'll be fine. I miss knowing yeah. that <laughs> animals. Uh, I know, so, it's so true, isn't it? It's that yeah. being on the ground for a long time. And I mean, going on safari is awesome. You go for three nights, you stay in a place, you get to know a place a little bit, but actually when you live there, and uh, you know you were breathing it in every single day. I always felt like that was that was a privilege. I never took it for granted when I was living out yeah. in the bush in the national parks, um, and even now I, and I craved it. You know, I'm in my 40s, and it's taken me a long time, you know, to build a, a safari company that gets me out to these different new places all the time. But finally, to get back onto the ground to be doing the research as well, I, I'm just it's so exciting to do that, and to be able to bring my kids out and uh, teach yeah. them, you know, this stuff as well. Um, they're completely disinterested, but that's irrelevant. Um, uh, it's a seed plant. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, they're like the Land is. Rovers. So. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I actually saw you, you mentioned the, the guides, um, and I saw some of the WhatsApps from your, that group, and I was really, really touched with one of them writing, saying, having learned about the elephants, I'm now more interested in them and, and starting to really like them. I said, like, mm. there we are. There's your hallelujah moment. Uh, yeah. When you've got an adult who's probably – had personal experience of elephants raiding his crops, every reason mm. to this. Like, you know, they're a thief as far as this guy is most likely concerned. Yeah. And yeah. to see that switch around once you start and understanding from the elephant perspective, yeah. um, amazing work. Um, before, we, before we wrap up, how can people support this work or is there something you would like people to be able to contribute to financially through knowledge, computing power, whatever it might be? What, what can people do to make a difference in the, the lives of elephants um, yeah. or communities. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously the, the big thing, I'm a really big believer these days, I've worked for conservation charities and now run my own uh, tourism business. I really am a big believer in conservation through hands-on tourism, um, mm -hmm. uh, the kind of thing that we run through Mats and Ridley Safaris and that you run at Natural Selection. Um, I, I really feel that's huge. Uh, so going on a safari makes a huge difference. Um, if you want to go further than that, I mean, I, I really love African parks. I think they're a fantastic organisation. If you're looking for one to support, make a donation to them. Um, I think it's AfricanParks.org. I'm just going to quickly look it up and put yes, it in. Yes, that's right. African parks. And they're doing great work everywhere across Africa. Um, and if you want to specifically get your... Uh, get involved in my elephant project you can actually come and participate in it and um, we have a number of our, our guests that have come over the years and some have become donors to the project like at the moment we're trying to raise funds to uh, run a guiding course uh, in elephant identification techniques for the local guides who are, the, who are literally the guys and girls running the show when I'm not there um, so if anyone wants to contribute that we're always looking for funds to, to build the local capacity to, to do the conservation. So what, what can people search for that? Um, probably best to go through matsonridley.org, so just to contact me direct. Um, and, um, yeah, so it's it's uh, Mats and Ridley, M-A-T-S-O-N. Oh, I'm um, going to get in there. R-I-D. I'm typing -E for you. I'm playing your secretary here. Don't good job, worry. good job. There you are. <laughs> Fantastic, um, thank you. Right, okay, well. Uh, oh, sorry, that wasn't .org, Pete. That was uh, .com, right? .com. Yeah, and yeah. Was matsonridley com. Did I say org? Uh, you did say .org. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so okay. everybody, go and, correct Sorry. That. Sorry. go and correct that. And fortunately, this is being videoed, so they can see that um, in that case, I was misled. I've had two, one too many GNTs, obviously. I'm at the oh, tail end of the day GNT here. I've time yet here. I've got a, I've got a <laughs> solid seven or so hours to go until I can get yeah. into that. Um, but thank you very, very much. I mean, again, we could probably talk elephants for hours. I mean, we could talk poo for a solid hour. At least. Uh, I said it is It is the book that people don't realise that they should be reading. Um, <laughs> we should do that. We should write a joint book on poo. That would be awesome. It's better than the figurative shit that's out there. Uh, <laughs> not, of course, talking yeah. about our books, of course. Um, no. People should look for your books. Dry Water, Let Elephants Be Elephants. Uh, no, yeah. no, Elephant Dance. Sorry, Elephant uh, Dance. And um, Planet Elephant. Planet yeah. Elephant, sorry. They're yes. all, all available through my website, Tammy Matson. Dot com. Yeah. Look up those books um, and hopefully we can have you back on here. You've actually now become the first husband and wife team that have been on independently, having had Andy on Deep in the Bush as well. Yes, um, yes. Yep. He's just back from the reef. I've been doing more censuses and just, just finished he? actually. Yep. Fantastic. Yep. Um, yeah, and I know that you're locked onto into Australia until the government lets you back out, but hopefully we're going to see you in Africa soon. Yeah, I'm going to be there next month. 
I am so jealous. You're just yeah. killing me. Yeah. I'm jealous of myself because <laughs> I'm not there yet. Oh, um, man. Thanks very yeah. much, Tammy. And you can go and have another G and T now. I will. Fantastic. It's almost bedtime here. Quarter past eight. Yep. Definitely bedtime. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Pete, thank you so much for having me. Good to talk to you. Thanks, Tammy. Bye. Cheers.